Hello, uh, and thank you all for coming to um, this installment of the series that I do here at the Hopkinton Council on Aging. My name is Arthur Bergeron. Uh, for those of you who haven't uh, been with us here before, uh, I'm an attorney. I work at Myrick O'Connell. Myrick O'Connell, there are 60 of us. There are 40 in Worcester and 20 in Westboro. Um, I do nothing but elder law. The other 59 do something else. That's one of the things I like about being there is that I can just focus on these issues. So um, I have been doing presentations here now for a while in Hopkinton. What I, tr I try to do for a year, and one of them is this kind of overview presentation. It's Elder Law 101 that includes updates because things change. It's in the nature of my work. A lot of things change. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a couple of those things. But the, the point of Elder Law 101 is to be talking really to folks, to, to give you a comprehensive sense if you are, pro if you are kind of in the group that talked to me, uh, and my average, my average client age is about 74. Um, so it's folks that are retired, uh, typically, or are at least not making what they used to make, and they've got some pretty straightforward goals. They, um, they uh, well, typically they look a lot like Frank and Mary. Uh, if you've been here, you know them, Frank and Mary and their children, Peter, Paul, and Mary, Jr. And I always tell people, if you get the joke, that means you're old enough to be my client. So, <clears throat> and their goal is very simple. Um, uh, they want to uh, live in their house until they die. They want to be buried in the backyard. And, and when, when one of them dies, they want to leave everything to the other. Uh, and when the two of them are dead, they want to leave everything to their children. And they own a house. It's not a really big house, a little house, but they have no mortgage. $300,000 house. They have, joint, they have a, a joint account. Uh, worth a, or Frank has an IRA worth 150,000. They have an annuity worth 100, and they have bank accounts worth 75 for a total of 625,000 dollars. So they're not wealthy, but they're okay. They've got some reserves. Uh, their income is okay. Frank's income is 2,000 a month, 1,500 from Social Security, and 500 from a pension. Mary's is half of his, 750 a month. So they're going to do okay. Um, and they are stable unless they've got big nursing home problems. We'll talk about that in a little while. Um, but their first question often to me if these folks come in is they said, so what do I need for legal documents? Don't I need a will? Um, and the answer to that actually in this situation is that they really don't um, as long as their their, what they want to have happen when one of them dies is that everything goes to the other and that following the both of their deaths, everything goes to their children, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. Because if they die, um, well right now they, their assets are all um, um, structured so that if one of them dies, um, the other one gets all the assets pretty much, right? So if Frank dies in this situation, Mary becomes the owner of the house because it's jointly held. The annuity is jointly held. The bank accounts are jointly held. So Mary would simply instantly become the owner. Um, even as to assets of which Frank died owning individually, uh, Mary would become the owner because under Massachusetts law, if you have no will, there is a set of rules that have been established to deal with where things go. The Commonwealth has basically written a will for you. It's called the rules of intestacy, and that's how it works. That if one spouse dies, the other spouse gets everything. If the second spouse dies, it gets divided among your children, right? So she doesn't they don't really need a will. Uh, they may want one, and I'll talk for a little bit later on in, in case they want to do something a little different here. What they really need are these three basic things. Very straightforward, a healthcare proxy, a most, and a power of attorney. So how many know how, what a most is? Raise your hand. Oh, that's one. That's, that, that's a pretty much the average, right, that I get on these. The most, uh, the medical order for life-sustaining treatment, medical orders for life-sustaining treatment, uh, is, the, is the document meant to replace the so-called DNR, or do not resuscitate order that people had done before. We're going to talk about that a little bit. First, I just want to talk about healthcare proxies. Now, I know most of you think you have healthcare proxies right now, and you may. Uh, many people will say, well, I signed one when I went to the hospital. If I had an emergency, you know, I went in, I got admitted, they signed a healthcare proxy. Well, if, if you did, then when you left the hospital, they threw that away, so you don't have a healthcare proxy. Um, you may have one. I encourage people to make sure that they're at least or less than five years old. Not that they expire, but that when you need someone who's going to believe that it's still in force, you're not talking to a lawyer, you're talking to a doctor. Not only aren't they lawyers, they hate lawyers. Doctors can't stand lawyers, right? They all think we're going to sue them. So you, you want a document that really looks fresh, and that's why you should keep one that's less than five years old. They're very simple. Uh, you need two witnesses in order, to, in order to have one executed. Anybody can be the two witnesses. 
uh, accept the person that you're actually naming as the uh, proxy. The proxy only takes effect when your doctor has said in writing that you are incapable of making a medical decision. In that case, the proxy has all control over your medical decisions. If you've done something like a, what, what often referred to as a living will, a set of instructions regarding how are you going to be treated, none of that's enforceable. None of that is legally enforceable in Massachusetts. So it's all about the proxy. So if you want a particular, if you've got particular concerns regarding how you want to be treated, you want to tell your proxy. And if you've got a bunch of kids and you think that they might be fighting about that, you might want to write something down to give to your proxy just so that he or she in that emergency situation isn't going to get hassles from the other brothers or sisters. But none of that's legally binding. The healthcare proxy trumps everything, okay? Now, the only reason I've ever heard why someone doesn't want to do a healthcare proxy is like, oh, they might throw me in a nursing home. Um, because technically the decision to have someone admitted to a nursing home uh, is a healthcare decision. So if your doctor says that you are legally incompetent, your proxy could, could go to the nursing home and say, I want Ma to come, or Dad. It's usually Ma. Usually by that time, Dad's dead, right? But sometimes it's Dad. So, uh, but the key to know is that if you're at the nursing home with your daughter at that point, and you say, oh, I don't want to go to the nursing home. I don't want to be here. Um, that technically, under a, a case that, was done, that happened several years ago, revokes your proxy. The court has said you always have the power to revoke your proxy even if you're crazy. And the court has said that your refusal to accept medical treatment that is ordered by your proxy amounts to your revocation of the proxy. And in that case it would take a court order to get you into that nursing home. Now if you're on the other side of that, which often happens, I've got younger people saying you mean my mother has got dementia and she's really crazy and I can't get her into a nursing home? The answer to that is yes, that's true. Uh, the nursing home technically is supposed to not let her in, but it has been my experience, and I've been doing this for almost 40 years, that those things always seem to work out. You know, you drop somebody off at the nursing home, oh, it, it seems bad, it gets better. But I'm just telling you that if, if Ma objects, uh, the nursing home has every right to say, sorry, Ma can't come. Finally, um, as I have just mentioned, you, if you sign a healthcare proxy, you can always revoke it. Um, the healthcare proxy, there is one specific aspect of the healthcare proxy that you should be aware of. It does not die at your death, actually, the way a power of attorney does. It survives, and your proxy remains in charge of one and only one thing, and that is donating your body to the New England Organ Bank. Um, you may think that the only way any part of your body or your remains could be donated to the organ bank is if you sign a form at the registry, do this thing, have something on your license. That is incorrect. Actually, your, health, your proxy has po the power to sign your body over. So the one kind of instruction that you may want to put in your healthcare proxy, if you don't want to have that happen, is something that says, I don't want my remains to be going to the organ bank. That is the one thing you could put in the proxy as an instruction, which uh, is legally binding, because ironically, at that point, you're dead. At the, uh, otherwise, remember, the healthcare proxy always has the power to do what the healthcare proxy wants. So that's the healthcare proxy, the most uh, medical orders for life sustaining treatment, M O L S T. All of your doctors have these. The Department of Public Health has been encouraging your doctors to be talking to you about them. <clears throat> and more significantly, uh, as of this past January 1, um, Medicare has agreed to pay for that visit. Doctors typically don't like to talk about a lot of this stuff because they like to talk about saving people, not letting people not be saved. Um, but, it, but the other reason why sometimes they don't talk about it is they're really busy and not, they weren't getting paid to do this. So now finally Medicare has agreed that a, a consultation regarding these issues is of such significance that that conversation that Medicare will pay for. Technically a most uh, like a DNR is not the significant signature on that form is not yours. You are not giving this order to other people regarding how to treat yourself. Re treat yourself. Your doctor is. So your doctor's signature is the important signature. You will sign. You will, the doctor will want you to assent to it, so that he doesn't get in trouble. But it's it's really an order from the doctor to the people down the food chain, the EMT and the nurses, etc. That says here's how you should treat this person. This is a medical order. You should always put that form on the refrigerator. 
Now that sounds stupid that there's actually an official place to put it, but it's true. And the, the reason for that is that all of the EMTs, the ambulance services, that's how they all get trained. They go into the house, you're on the floor or wherever. Now they're really in a hurry here to decide what to do, but they're supposed to look at the refrigerator to see if there's a mold form, any instructions regarding what to not do. And if it's not there, they're gonna stop looking because they're busy, okay? So, so you want to make sure it's on the refrigerator. Remember that your, power, your healthcare proxy can overrule anything that's on the MOLST form on your behalf. So if you're on the floor and your daughter's next to you and the EMT says, oh, the MOLST form says leave her in the house, and, the, and your daughter says, nope, take her to the hospital, you're going to the hospital. So once again, you always want to be communicating, you want to be confident that your proxy is going to do what you really want to do. A couple of the things that are on that most formal, first there is the old CPR provision, the provision that says, if I have stopped breathing, or excuse me, if my heart has stopped, I want you to try to start it through cardiopulmonary resuscitation. And the usual way to do that is to press on your heart really hard in a way that probably will break all of your ribs uh, in order to try to get your heart to be going again or to kind of electroshock your heart in order to get going. Now, either of those, is incredibly painful. So you don't want to go through that. It will, and, if, and if it doesn't work, then what you've done is you've basically said, I want to, if I'm going to die in this incredibly painful way, right? Which is, you know, maybe worth the risk if you figure it's going to, you know, come, bring, make you come back, you know, the CPR. Now, I know I've done this presentation with a geriatrician, a wonderful geriatric uh, doctor, named Michelle Ricard, who, who referred me to a, a Canadian study that she said indicated that um, the, the statistics are that if you are over 70 years old and you get CPR administered to you, your chances of living for more than 30 days are 5%. 5%. It's 25% that you're going to be, you know, get, not die right away, right? 5% that you're going to live for more than 30 days. So when you're deciding on this form and talking to your doctor, maybe you want to weigh that out. You know, it's, just, it's your life. I guess that's the point. It's your life. You want to think about that. Similarly with intubation. Intubation means you've stopped breathing and someone is, needs to stick a pipe down your throat into your lungs and then push air into it to try to get it to, you, to breathe. So once again, it's a very, it's not fun, you know. So you want to decide whether that's what you want. Now there are several other possibilities in the MOLST form, which you should go over with your doctor. The one that I try to emphasize is do not hospitalize. So, so Frank and Mary, remember, they wanted to die and be buried in the backyard. And they really want to die at home. They don't want to die in a hospital. You know, I always hear the kind of basic line, don't, if they, I don't want to be plugged into all these tubes, you know, I don't, you know. Well, if you don't, well, then you don't want to go to the hospital because that's what they do with the hospital. They kind of plug you in. Um, there are two reasons for that. One, if I'm a doctor, I have been trained to save people. I haven't been trained to really help people figure out how they want to um, live at the end of their lives and whether they want to let go of their lives at some point. And so that's very difficult, especially I'm at, at the hospital. By the way, if you are interested in a great book that talks about these issues, there is a book called Being Mortal, Being Mortal by a guy named Atul Gawande, A-T-U-L Gawande, G-A-W-A-N-D-E, an Indian doctor. Um, Indian American was born in the United States. His father was a surgeon. He's a surgeon. He's a, he actually teaches at the uh, Harvard uh, Public Health School and is a surgeon at one of, the, one of the, the big ones in Boston, but talks through these issues. So anyway, uh, the doctors aren't, you know, they're going to save you and the hospital is going to save you. I, I was for many years, I was on the board at Marlboro Hospital. Um, and I know that monthly we would have at the Board of Trustees meetings, we'd have this, this summary of what happened in the hospital the previous month, kind of what the stats were. And one of the stats was how many people died in our hospital, right? We don't want that to be a big number. Because if it is, the Department of Health is calling us and we're getting calls from the Joint Commission in Washington and what are you doing wrong? So if you're in our hospital, we're gonna save you. So if you wanna die at home, then you wanna say do not hospitalize, okay? Um, the alternative to this is guardianship. You need to understand um, legally, if you can't make a medical decision yourself, nobody can make that decision for you unless the probate court has named a guardian. Your husband can't, your wife can't, your kids can't. Now doctors and hospitals have, in most cases, let this go. 
and accepted decisions by other people, even when there wasn't a proxy. But, you know, the world's not going in that direction, right? The world's going in the direction of people saying, I don't want to get sued. I don't want to get sued. I'm not going to take anybody's word unless I know they've got the legal authority. So you want to take care of this, okay? Guard it. So power of attorney, very straightforward. A power of attorney does not just take effect after you are incapacitated. A power of attorney is a person through, is a document through which you are giving someone else, your attorney. Um, by the way, well, I thought you thought I was an attorney. Well, I'm a special kind. I'm an attorney at law. That means I have the right on your behalf to appear before a judge, right? But anybody who is acting on your behalf, making legal decisions, is technically acting as your attorney, okay? So the power of, attor so the power of attorney is giving someone to do, act on your behalf. Cash a check, sign a document, do anything, any of those things. Now, that takes effect immediately unless you specifically say in the power of attorney, I don't want this to take effect until it has been determined that I am disabled. We never recommend that language in a power of attorney. And the reason for that is if I am a third party, so suppose you're, you know, you're, your attorney is going to the bank, your son's going to the bank or your daughter with this power of attorney and talking to me, the bank teller, and showing me this document. But now the document's got this little clause. Now, first of all, I'm not a lawyer, and the little clause is like on page four, you know, so I'm going through it, and I see this little clause that says, only takes effect when I'm disabled, when this person's disabled. And I say to the person, well, how do I know your dad's disabled? Oh, well, I got a doctor's certificate. Well, how do I know that that's disabled enough to mean that you should be the power of attorney? And now all of a sudden you're having this conversation that you just don't need to be having. So if your concern is that your attorney may abuse the power in the power of attorney, right, then the most typical way to deal with that is give it to your lawyer or give it to some third party with instructions that says, don't release this document until you're convinced that I'm incapacitated. We'll give it to someone that you trust, okay? So, in general, powers of attorney take effect right away. Do they have to be witnessed? No. Do they have to be notarized? Actually, no. Not unless the attorney, your attorney, uh, is going to be signing a deed or a mortgage or something on your behalf that gets recorded in the registry of deeds. In, uh, in that case, they do need a notarization, otherwise they don't, right? Should they be uh, notarized? Yes. The reason for that is, once again, this is just from experience. People see documents with a notary seal and they go, whoa, that's really a legal document. That must be really official, right? So you're getting it notarized, not because it needs to be notarized, but because everybody thinks it needs to be notarized, right? And therefore, it'll be easier for the people to deal with it. I've used this line before. My, my wonderful daughter, who actually is a lawyer now and just got married on, on Sunday to another lawyer, oh my God, uh, when she was in high school, gave me a t-shirt that said, the good lawyer knows the law, the great lawyer knows the judge. And in the case of a power of attorney, the judge, once again, is a lay person. So you want it to look official, okay? Um, two things more about the power of attorney. One, <clears throat> it's important um, if you want that attorney to be able to deal with issues around asset restructuring, which is what I do a lot of related to mass health related concerns, it's very important that that power be in the power of attorney, that your attorney be given the specific power to make gifts to other people, uh, and ideally if, if, if the, if, to make gifts to themselves. Uh, otherwise, they can't, right? And the reason why this is of some significance is many powers of attorney are dra have been drafted by people, attorneys who are mainly interested in financial issues, estate tax related issues. And so there'll be a provision in the power of attorney that says the attorney can make gifts to family members or even to the attorney himself or herself but not in an amount that exceeds the federal gift tax maximum, um, which right now, I wouldn't even go into what that means, but right now it's $14,000. Um, so I had this situation very recently, like two weeks ago, where I have a husband and a wife, and the husband's in the, in the excuse me, the wife is in the nursing home, the husband is out. We're trying to restructure assets by shifting everything to him so that we can qualify her for mass health. Except I can't, because she's incapacitated now, and his power of attorney, which was drafted by somebody else, says that, she, that he, on her behalf, can't give away more than $14,000. Well, I've got a couple hundred thousand dollars to give away, which means I can't do what I need to do unless I get a conservatorship, unless I go to court 
and get uh, the husband or somebody appointed as the conservator for the wife. That will take me about three months. It'll cost about $10,000 in attorney's fees. But more important, during those three months, that wife is going to be on private pay at the nursing home paying $14,000 a month. So that cost of that little clause in that power of attorney is 10,000 plus 14,000 times three, right? Uh, or about $50,000, right? So you want to be careful on that. You want to look. Um, finally, powers of attorney as opposed to healthcare proxies. Your proxy, you can only name one person at a time as your proxy. Power of attorney, you can name multiple people. So you can name a couple of your kids jointly and severally or your husband or your wife and your child jointly and severally, which means if it's jointly, you do that if you don't trust them, right? Because you want to make sure everybody signs on the power for anything. Or jointly and severally means any one of the people involved could sign on your behalf. So that if you have a child or children who aren't around here or traveling, that way any one of them can deal with your issues. So that's power of attorney. Um, now let's talk a little bit about probate. So I was mentioning uh, that for Frank and Mary, given where they want to go, they really don't need a will. Um, and the reason is what, what I described to you, because the probate court, whether they have a will or not, will divide things they, the way they want it divided. Now, many people will tell me that they have a will because they wanted to avoid probate. That, doesn't, that isn't how it works. If you own any assets in your own individual name, solely, as opposed to owning it jointly with somebody else, as with rights of survivorship, which is common with Frank, where Frank and Mary have their house that way, or their bank accounts, or many people will own a so-called life estate in a piece of property. Many people will be, have done planning for mass health asset protection purposes and they'll have conveyed away their house, for example, to a trust or to their kids and kept a life estate. The legal consequence of joint ownership or of the life estate ownership is that when that person dies who owns that interest, their interest evaporates and therefore there doesn't have to be a determination by the probate court of who owns that asset. For anything that's owned individually though, there does have to be that determination. Someone has to figure out who owns that property. So property that, assets that are in individual names are always subject to probate. So in Frank and Mary's case, as, we just, as I just mentioned earlier, if Frank were to die, um, and by the way, the IRA is in Frank's name, and so he thinks he owns it, but he really doesn't. Really, the bank owns that money. It, he just has kind of the right to get it from them. And so what he has done, probably, is, in, is, is when he created that account, he named a death beneficiary with the bank and, t and told the bank, well, you pay this other person if I die. It's very much like a life insurance contract. And therefore, that asset doesn't have to go through probate. So if Frank died, then there would need, not need to be a probate in that case. If Mary then died, though, there would need to be a probate, okay? Because Mary would own some of those assets individually, like the bank account and the house. So how do, they, how do you avoid that? No, no, stop, sorry, I'm gonna step back. And as to those assets, as I explained, the assets without a will would simply get divided equally among the three kids. And with a will, that's what she wanted, is that the assets would be divided among the three kids. So the question is, does she need a will? Well, these are the questions she should ask herself before she decides that. Um, does any of the children uh, have creditor issues? Does any of them have a, have a marriage issue? Any of those kids, the, the, you know, the son or daughter-in-law that you never liked in the first place, you know? And, and then the, the, or does any of them have a disability? Because if they've got a creditor, creditor issue and Mary dies and leaves the money to the child, you're really leaving it to the creditor because the creditor is going to sue them and get the money. Um, or, or if they've got a tax problem, for example. Uh, if there's a bad marriage and the child inherits the money, then that money is going to be in play if, the, if a divorce later shows up. And finally, if, one of those ch if that child has a disability, if the child is on mass health right now, uh, and mass health has an asset cap to it, it's means-tested program, or if that child is on SSI, Social Security, uh, um, Supplemental Social Security Income, um, then that child may get knocked off of the benefit program by virtue of inheriting this money. In any of those cases, the solution is fairly simple. You need to do a will, uh, and in that will you need to say that the assets that were going to go to that child will instead go in trust for the benefit of that child. Typically you would name one of the other children as the trustee, and as long as the child that you're worried about does not have the legal right to get the money out of that trust, the, the, the trustee can have the total discretion to give it to them 
if their problem has gone away, the divorce has happened or the creditors have been resolved or whatever. But as long as the child who is the, 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 the child of concern doesn't have the right to the money, then it protects them from creditors and divorce and is not countable in terms of qualifying them for government benefits. Finally, the house. So Frank and Mary say that they want their kids to get all of their assets in equal shares. But what they really mean regarding the house is that they want the house sold and the money distributed. They're not really just giving them the house. This isn't like the old days and you know, they're all gonna share the farm, you know? Um, I mean, by the way, that's a little different. I do a lot of work in Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket. So there, nobody wants to sell the house. Everybody wants to save the house because they all want to go visit, right? That's a different issue. But here, typically you want to sell the house. So the problem in this case, if you leave the house to the kids, is that you've left the house to the kids. That means they all own the house. They each have a one-third share in this case, which means if they need to do anything or if they want to sell, everybody's got to agree to sell, right? And if, they want, if one of the children wants to live there, he can because he owns a share of the house. The other two can't throw him out, right? Even if he's not paying the taxes or the insurance or letting the house run down. So there are all these issues that can come about if the three of them own the house. So if you don't want that, then what you should do is have a will and in the will say, it's my desire that the house be sold and the proceeds be distributed. As opposed to, it's my desire that they simply each get a third of the house, okay? So there may be reasons to have a will, um, uh, what about if you want to avoid probate, if you just don't want to go through that? Well, you know, you've heard about trusts in order to do that, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. But if you, if you don't want to go there, there are some other alternatives. Um, there is joint ownership, as I said. If Mary owns everything jointly with one or more of her children, then upon her death, her interest evaporates, her children become the sole owners of that property. So if she's comfortable, having joint ownership with her kids, she can therefore avoid probate. Uh, or in many cases, I'll find that there is typically a designated child who is the one that the parent really trusts. It's typically a daughter. It's the designated daughter, right? And they'll say, well, you know, I'm just going to put everything jointly in that with me and that daughter because I trust that when I die, she's going to take everything and divide it equally. She's going to, you know, among the other kids, right? And that may work, you know, and you may be comfortable with that. And, and that does avoid probate regarding all of those assets, right? To the extent that you have any concern about that or that there's maybe a problem with that, one possibility would be to actually put the assets in joint names, um, but also have a very simple will um, that says, you know, my intention is to divide all of my assets equally among my children. So that if for some reason, you know, the assets are going into joint names and you may even want to say in the will, it's my intention that regarding even any assets that are held jointly with my, with anybody, right? It's my intention that those assets be divided up, right? You may, that may give folks more kind of a level of comfort that, that, that in the event that something is going wrong, there's going to be some kind of a backup plan, okay? But the point is you, she can avoid probate that way. Oftentimes people will use that life estate for that reason also. Many people will, will keep a life estate in their house, that is total control of their house until they die, but transfer a so-called remainder interest, that is the right to the house after they die, to their kids or to a trust or whatever. The legal consequence of that is that when the older person dies, their interest simply evaporates. That also avoids probate. What about, so that typically then just leaves, oh, it leaves the car. So the car, by the way, is one of the most common reasons why people have to go through these small probates, right? Because the car, when you die, if you die with a spouse, um, then there is a special state statute that says that the spouse is presumptively the new owner of the car, even if the car was just in your name. But in Mary's case, if she's dying, that doesn't work with the kids, right? So her only way out of that is to actually name one of the kids as a joint owner on the car, right? Now, the child may be very nervous about that. You know, Ma's not a very good driver now. You know, maybe if I get sued. So they, you may have to deal with that through insurance. But if you want to avoid probate, that's kind of the way to do it. The stuff in the house. So technically, when Mary dies, all the things in the house are actually subject to probate too, regarding how things are supposed to be divided up. But as a practical matter, once again, this is just from experience, I have yet to find a case where anybody decided they needed to go to the probate court to figure out, you know, who owned the dresser 
and the dishes and all that stuff, you know. Now I do have, uh, one, of my, one of my associates actually did find herself spending a lot of time and a lot of her clients' money arguing with two other relatives over a particular cardboard Santa. That cardboard Santa was about $25,000 worth of attorney's fees. But you can tell there was something else going on there. It wasn't really all about the Santa. So, so typically, people will just divide that stuff up, right? If you've got a particular way that you want it divided up, my suggestion would be just write a letter to your kids, right? It says, here's how I want it divided up. If you want to be on the safe side, you could also do a deed or do a will that, you, that is it, it saying it's my, my goal that all my assets are going to be divided equally among my kids, right? And then, you know, you die and the kids are going to look at the will and say, so we got two choices here. We can either just divide up the assets or we can file a will, go through probate, spend a couple thousand dollars on the lawyer, and then we can divide up the assets. So which one are we going to do? Let's just divide up the assets, right? So that's a simple way. Another thing that you can do, um, this has been used um, several times by clients if, they, if th things aren't going to children, people who don't have children, they just want to make sure the stuff is taken care of, they'll do a, a deed, a so-called chattel deed. Um, technically, a deed is a document through which property is conveyed from one person to another. Uh, we associate that only with real estate, but in the old days, deeds were used for a whole bunch of stuff, to sell cows and horses and farm implements and a whole bunch of things. And they were called chattel deeds. All of this property was called chattel. Um, th that was also the document that was used um, to sell slaves. You would buy a slave and you'd get a chattel deed for that slave, which is the reason why I think this term has come into kind of disrepute, because people associate it with slavery. Uh, and so that, I think, and I, my sense is that historically that's where these other things started to arise. The so-called bill of sale for a dollar, right? If you've seen those, a bill of sale for a dollar. Now, th those documents I just find offensive because it seems like a contradiction in terms. How can you be selling something for a dollar? You're not really, you're giving it away, right? But if you were giving it, you would give it through a chattel deed. But anyway, that's what a bill of sale for a dollar is, basically. It's a chattel deed. You're saying, I'm transferring something for a dollar, so it's a gift. So anyway, you can, she can, Mary's children can avoid probate, or Mary can plan it that way. Another way is through the use of revocable trust. What if Mary uh, is concerned about having her children on her bank accounts or on the deed to the house? Because, you know, maybe she wants to know she can use the house. If she's getting older, she may want to be able to use the equity for a reverse mortgage. She may want to be able to sell it and not have to go talk to her kids about it. Well, in that case, what she could do is she could create a revocable and amendable trust. A trust a, it is, is simply is not a, a separate legal person the way a corporation is or a limited liability company. It's simply a description of a relationship between two kinds of people, the trustee, who is the legal owner of stuff, who is, doing, who is owner, though, for the benefit of someone else called the beneficiary. So Mary can't, could, if she wanted to make sure that, that her house didn't have to go through probate, she could basically say, I'm going to create a trust. I'm going to name myself as the trustee for the benefit of myself and my kids. But I'm going to say in that trust, I can amend this at any time. I can keep all the assets that are in trust. I can do whatever I want. But I'm going to say, when I die, I'm going to name a new trustee who's going to be probably one of the kids, to deal with this after I die. Now, the legal consequence of that, as to any of the property that she puts into that trust, is that when she dies, the new trustee immediately takes, takes over and can take all of the property that's in trust and divide it up without having to go through probate. Now, the reason why you want to avoid probate, you know, it's not that it's like terrible to go in probate, but the probate process always takes at least a year. And the reason for that is, if you die, your creditors have the right to sue your estate for up to a year following the date of your death to get paid. So if I have in a car accident with you and I run over you today, uh, you have three years from, the day of, uh, the, from that day of the accident to sue me for that uh, and get damages. If I run over you but then I hit a tree and I die, you only have one year from that day to sue my estate, right? So it's actually considered to be a short statute of limitations. But for that reason, the kids that would be taking property from my estate have to wait for a year to see if anybody has done that, if anybody has sued, okay? So probate always takes a year. The other thing is it costs you some money because chances are you don't want to try to fill out these probate forms yourself. I mean, they're really bad. 
Um, so you're going to be spending some money on a lawyer, three to five thousand dollars to go through the probate process. So Mary may want to avoid that, and she can through this revocable trust. She names her child as the successor. Is there anything bad about a revocable trust? Well, really, no. Um, it doesn't add any complexity to your life tax-wise because these revocable trusts are considered to be so-called grantor taxable trusts. It is for the IRS and Department of Revenue purposes, it's as if they don't exist. It's as if they don't exist. They don't file separate tax returns. Even if, even if there's income that's coming to you as the trustee of that trust, you just report it on your own tax return. It's, just, it's all, it's, it's yours, okay? Similarly, that does not protect the property um, for mass health purposes because for mass health purposes too, the property is still considered to be yours. And the reason why I emphasize that is that I often have situations where people, when they were in their 60s maybe, um, or 70s, did a revocable trust to avoid probate and then they became in their 80s and their 90s and now somebody needs nursing home care and the kids come in and show me this trust and they say, oh, the property is in trust, we're all set, right? And I'll say, well, no, you know, if the property is in trust, but it's revocable and amendable, then it's still Mary's asset, which means that it's still countable for mass health purposes, and we're going to have to deal with that, right? So it doesn't do anything as far as that stuff is concerned, but it does avoid probate. Finally, mass health 101. So mass health, <clears throat> I would say most of the people who talk to me are talking to me, among other reasons, because either they have dementia or they have Alzheimer's, or somebody they know have, has Alzheimer's, or they're worried about getting it in the future. Um, Alzheimer's uh, it causes about 70% of the cases of dementia. Uh, dementia is not a disease. Dementia is simply a set of symptoms. And basically, if I were trying to briefly describe those symptoms, it's your memory's bad. And, but it, the, worse you, the more you've got the symptom, the worse your memory is. So eventually, you kind of forget to do everything, kind of like how to go to use the bathroom and how to walk, you know, how to do everything, right? Uh, and now, Alzheimer's is the, it causes about 70% of those, uh, but also Parkinson's disease, something called Lewy body dementia. There are a number of ways you get dementia. Um, but folks are, who are, are concerned about this often, and so th they often want to do planning in order to avoid um, uh, this possibility that one of them could end up in a nursing home because that nursing home care is not going to be covered by Medicare or any other health insurance policy. Medicare and other health insurance, they're health insurance. They cover the cost of getting better, not the cost of staying the same. If you're staying the same, which means if you're in the nursing home for more than 100 days, you're going to be on private pay unless you're on mass health. So people are very interested in how mass health works. So remember this is Frank and Mary, and those are their assets, right? So, so if, if Mary needs nursing home care today, and the assets are just the way you see them. Own, everything's owned jointly, and Frank's got the IRA. Um, how many of you think that Frank's going to need to spend some money now on private pay before he can qualify Mary for mass health? Could you just raise your hand if you think that's the case? Ah, well, then you're going to learn a new thing. You're wrong. Uh, um, the, and the reason for that is that um, while, while if Mary is in the nursing home and, is, and Medicare is not covering her, and she needs to qualify for MassHealth, and once she has qualified, by the way, MassHealth will pay the difference between her income, which you may recall was $750 a month, and whatever the nursing home bill is. So for her to qualify, she needs to show she has less than $2,000 in countable assets. Frank, on the other hand, since he's still alive and at home, can own the home itself, as long as it has an equity of less than $828,000, um, can have other cash or cash equivalent assets of up to $119,220 and can have infinite income, infinite income. So if Mary's in the nursing home today and Frank comes in to me and says, oh, I'm in trouble. I didn't know any planning. You know, we know we should have done this because he's heard all those ads that said, oh, you had to transfer everything out. You had to wait five years, blah, blah, blah. I, the, my greatest moment in, in, often in a week is when I get people who come in this way and say, you, sh you know, you're okay, everything's gonna be fine. Because all you have to do is we're gonna shift everything to Frank. We're gonna ship the house to Frank. And remember the house is worth has equity of less than $828,000. We're gonna shift all the other assets to Frank. Now that's gonna put him over that 119,220 number, but he can have unlimited income. So all we have to do is take the remaining assets and turn those into income. So I need to take 
the IRA and the annuity and the bank account, so all that put together is $325,000. So what I'm going to do basically is I'm going to have Frank keep about $100,000 and go buy an annuity with the other $225,000. An annuity is a, is a contract between you and an insurance company. You give them money. They agree to pay you money back plus a very small amount of interest. You would not do this for, to, for the interest. You do this only to qualify it for mass health. These annuities, when you buy them from the companies, are actually called mass health qualifying annuities, right? Um, so Frank would take his $225,000 and go buy an annuity. As long as that annuity calls for equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than Frank's actuarial life expectancy, and if Frank is 85 years old, his life expectancy at that point would be about eight years, the purchase of that annuity in any amount is a legitimate conversion from a countable asset to a non-countable income stream. So as long as Frank buys an annuity that's big enough to get him below that magic number, $119,220, Mary, the next day, is eligible for Mass Health. And as long as she applies for Mass Health by, uh, you don't have to remember this, just want to get the concept, by the last day of the third month following the day on which she's eligible, the Mass Health will get paid retroactive to that day. So if, if she were in the nursing home today and Frank bought the, did all of this tomorrow, um, that means she'd be eligible by the next day. And if she were financially eligible by the next day, which would be June something, she would have until the end of July, August, September to apply to Mass Health. And once she qualified, it would be retroactive to the day after tomorrow. Okay? So the only issue here then is not well, what happens if one spouse needs nursing home care? Because in that case, they're all set because the other spouse is alive and at home. The problem is, what happens if, and, 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 and by the way, what I'm about to explain, um, you, you can't avoid probate by doing what I'm about to kind of go through. Um, so the main problem is, what happens if um, Frank dies under the current estate plan? Because remember, Mary becomes the owner of all the assets. Well, now there you got a problem, right? Because if Mary's in the nursing home and she can't have more than $2,000 in countable assets, all the money's got to get spent down. At that point, Mary will qualify for Mass Health because the house isn't countable, but it is lienable. So it will, she'll qualify for Mass Health, and Mass Health will put a lien on the house in order to get reimbursed after Mary dies. The, the most common way for couples to deal with this issue is to have them both change their wills or have a will. In this, this case, you have to have a will for this to work, right? You do a will, and it says, when I die, the assets that I, that I own in my own name, either some or all of them, will go, instead of going to my spouse, will go in trust for the benefit of my spouse. And I'll name one or more of my children as the trustee. If, if things are structured that way, and Frank owns all the assets, and he dies, the day after that, Mary is eligible for Mass Health, because all the assets are now in this trust for his benefit, right? If the trustees can use that money to supplement her care in any way they want, if Mary doesn't need Mass Health because she's still fine, but they want to make sure the assets are safe, they can just leave the assets in trust, knowing that she's always going to be protected. If she wants some of the assets back, she can always say to the trustees, I'd like some of the assets back, and they can give them to her, right? Now, once she's got them, if she then needs to qualify for Mass Health, she's going to have to spend down whatever she took back but everything that's still in trust is still safe, okay? So in, in the Frank and Mary case, if one of them needs nursing home care, they're just fine. So they don't have to do a lot of advanced asset protection for that. If they're worried, and most of my clients are in that case, what if I die, I wanna make sure my spouse is safe. Most people, that's what they'll tell me, right? I'm not worried about myself, I'm just worried about my spouse. If that's the case, then what you do is you change your will that way. Um, you don't have to restructure your assets early if you don't want to, right? But some folks do. Some folks will shift the assets into the name of the person who is older or who has had a lot of heart problems, maybe more likely to die suddenly, right, just to be on the safe side, but you don't have to. Now, if Frank has died and they haven't done any of that, though, and Mary now owns all of these assets, that's when you're kind of stuck with, and remember, those are her assets, um, that's when, if she wants to protect anything for mass health purposes, you're stuck with what you always hear about on the radio, right? She's going to have to gift things away and wait five years. If she wants an asset to be safe, it has to have been out of her control for at least five years, either because it was given to somebody uh, or because it was given to a trust, which is somebody, which is also somebody, 
where she is not a beneficiary, does not have the power to revoke that trust. To the extent that she is a beneficiary, the assets that she is entitled to get back by being a beneficiary are countable, okay? So that's kind of, th those are the options that she's kind of stuck with. Co often, folks, what, what in Mary's situation, Mary will say, you know, I really don't want to lose control of my cash, right? Because it's my cash, you know, and, and I'm, not, I'm feeling pretty good right now, and I don't want to lose control. I want to make sure, though, that my house is safe for my kids. It's not that you know, they're going to use the house, but it's safe for my kids so that when I die, at least I'm leaving them in the house and they can go sell it. That's the situation where these life estates are often used, where, where someone will, will transfer the house either to, directly to the kids, as I explained to you, or to a trust for the benefit of the kids, but will keep a life estate in the house so they'll keep control over it for their lifetime. Regarding other assets, other assets, money, CDs, anything, cash, stocks, bonds, they can also transfer the assets out, right? Until very recently, I was saying to folks, in that case, try to avoid these, so, these so-called irrevocable trusts. The way the trust typically works, you transfer assets to the trustee of a trust. The trustee is typically one of your kids. You put a provision in the trust that says that the trustee can distribute assets at any time to any of the beneficiaries, who are typically your other kids, right? And you, tell, and you tell the trustee, and once again, the reason why they call them trusts, you've got to trust the person who's the trustee, right? If you don't have that person, then you, this doesn't work, right? But you tell the trustee, look, if I need some money, right, just transfer it to yourself as a beneficiary and then give it to me. Um, and, and that's typically the way these have worked. And that sounds a lot like a scam, doesn't it? You know, that you'd kind of work, things, well, well, you know, and that's just the way the mass health folks were looking at this. And that's why over the last few years, more and more of, of, of the trusts kind of structured in this way have been challenged by the mass health caseworkers. Uh, and, and the assets were declared to be countable. In some of those cases, the superior courts have backed up the caseworkers. And that's why as elder law attorneys, we were increasingly telling people, in general, you kind of want to stay away from this. This could be trouble. Then came a case about a month and a half ago called Hein versus Medicaid, H-E-Y-N, Hein versus Medicaid, in which that exact trust was examined by a, the appeals court. And because it's an appeals court decision, the decision of that court is binding across the Commonwealth, uh, in which there was, a, there was a transfer by a little old lady to a trustee of a trust, and the trustee had the power to distribute to any of the, any of the kids at any time. And the caseworker said that's, that should be countable. Um, there were some other things in the trust that are not relevant here, but they also didn't knock it out. Um, and the court said, no, as far as we're concerned, that's okay. The mere fact that it is possible that the children might give the money back to the mother, right, does not, does not um, affect the fact that the trust specifically says that only the children can get the money. So the children, it's totally voluntary as far as the children are concerned, whether the money is coming back, and therefore the trust was determined to be okay. So now that device, re I am telling you, remains available, and all of us who are elder law attorneys feel a lot better about that. Um, this asset protection plan that we've just described also, by the way, can avoid probate. The asset protection plan for Frank and Mary, whereby the assets get held in, through Frank's will in a testamentary trust, I can't avoid probate and do that. This one actually also, this one though, just if Mary transfers assets out to this trustee, when she dies, those assets that are in trust are not gonna be subject to probate. So that is also gonna be avoiding probate. Um, one final thing. <clears throat> This is of less significance than it was two months ago. I was here a few months ago and I did a presentation on something else, but in the end talked about this. Uh, there was an outside section of the budget uh, that Governor Baker proposed, uh, which uh, would have substantially changed the recovery rules, the rules regarding how MassHealth can try to recover assets if they had, if for, from, a, from the estate of a dead person who had been on MassHealth. <clears throat> One of the changes was going to allow MassHealth, in the case of those life estates that I just described, to say that when the older person died, MassHealth would figure out the value of the life estate as of the moment before that person's death and would have a lien on that value as to that house, even though it was not a probate asset. <clears throat> the other change, even bigger, was it would have said, once again, in this Frank and Mary case, pretend Mary was in the nursing home, Frank was at home, Mary's on, Mass, on MassHealth, then she dies. And now all the assets are Frank's. And then Frank dies. 
a day later, a week later, a year later, 10 years later, Frank remarries. Uh, in any of those cases, under uh, out this, section, this outside section of the budget called outside section 11, MassHealth would have had a claim against the probate assets when Frank died. Right? This was a big deal. Um, apparently, that outside section itself is dead for this year, however, because enough people called enough legislators that, um, uh, it, it, that the House version of the budget excluded outside section 11, and the Senate version of the budget, which hasn't been passed yet, the Ways and Means recommendation regarding that budget also excludes outside section 11. So the effect is, it's not going to be effective, it's not going to pass this year, but the Baker administration has taken the position they're going to continue to push this. So you want to kind of continue to watch this. This, is, this could be a significant change for a lot of folks. Uh, let's see, we talked about that. Finally, uh, if you just thought this was so fascinating that you just want to watch it again because I was talking too fast, Frank and Mary have their own YouTube channel, uh, Elder Law Frank and Mary. Uh, also, uh, the folks from Hopkins and Cable have been kind enough to be here, and I know that they rebroadcast these shows. So you could probably ca uh, call or email them and find out when the show is being rebroadcast. Uh, any questions? Any questions? I know we covered a lot of stuff. And I'm going to stay for a few minutes afterwards, but I just wanted to check quickly. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> If you, the question is, if you own a house, can you give it to your daughter for a dollar? Yes. You can even give it to her for less than a dollar. You can give it to her for zero. Um, for mass health purposes, though, unless it was five years after you gave it to her that you're trying to qualify for mass health, they're going to say that was an invalid transfer and they're going to force the house to come back to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, otherwise, they're just going to say you don't qualify. They can't force you to, her to give the house back, but they won't qualify you for mass health if you need it. You've got to wait five years. You've got to wait five years. Okay. Five years and a day after you've done that, transfer the house is safe. The thing that you want to do, though, in that case, remember, if you give your daughter the house, if you give your daughter the house, you're also giving her your tax basis in the house. So whatever you bought that house for, right, the difference between that and what she sells the house for uh, is going to be taxed at capital, is, there's going to be a capital gains tax on that unless she lives in that house. If she lives in the house, then you don't have a problem, and this is easy. But the way that people typically avoid this issue, this is one of the reasons they use the life estate. They'll transfer the house to their child or children. Keep a life estate in the property. The effect of keeping the life estate is that for tax purposes, for estate tax purposes, the property is still yours, which means at your death, um, the property value is included in the estate, which means that for capital gains tax purposes, the so-called tax basis of the property jumps to the date of death value. So when she goes to sell the property, then she will not pay a capital gains tax unless she sells for more than the date of death value. So that's, that's of significance if she weren't living there. If, if she's going to be living there, it doesn't make any difference because she's going to have the same, the, the, you, she's going to be okay. okay. Yep. There are two daughters. So yeah. One, I'm going to sell for a dollar just for saying. Now, even though I'm still going to be alive in living there, the daughter will have the I hear what you're saying. You're, you're describing the fact that you're going to do the transfer and that, 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 that she's going to take out the loan in order to pay off the other daughter, right? So, so remember that if, if you do that and then she takes out the loan to pay the other daughter, right? And then you need nursing home care within five years, you're going to have a big problem because the value of the gift that you just made, right, for mass health purposes is going to be the entire value of that house. And they're going, to make you, they're going to make you ineligible for mass health for a period equal to that value divided by about $300. So if your house is worth $300,000 and, uh, and you transfer it to her and you need mass health tomorrow, right? And, you, and they can't give you the house back, you're going to be excluded from mass health eligibility for 1,000 days. It's a, that's $300,000 divided by 100. Isn't that right? I think that's right, yeah, for a thousand days, so three years. So this could cause you big problems. So you just gotta make sure you're gonna be really healthy, right, for that period, or else, because there's gonna be no money to give back because of what you just described, because the other daughter's gonna have half the cash and she's just gonna have the house, so she can't do a mortgage. You just wanna be aware of that. So she could not sell it then? Well, except it's only gonna have half of its value because she gave the other half to the, the other daughter, right? You just wanna be, you may wanna think that out a little bit more, okay? Uh, any other questions? 
Uh, yes, ma'am, and you, sir, and you, sir, and then we're done. Yes, ma'am. Can she sell the property for the current value? Sure, if she gets paid the current value. Yeah, so if she do that, is that she still have to wait for five years? Something? Well, no, because, but then she's got all the money. So the question is, what if, can she avoid this problem with mass health by selling for the real value and getting the money? Uh, well, that certainly solves the house problem, except that now she has $300,000. So if she goes to qualify for mass health, she's got to spend down that $300,000 before she can qualify. But that's the same thing as if she kept the house, right? Except she's going to have to wait five years regarding that gift. Otherwise, if she's trying to qualify for Mass Health, Mass Health is going to say she's ineligible for $300,000 divided by the, that $300 a day. Remember, it's the same rule. No matter what she's giving away, during that five years, Mass Health is going to apply that same ineligibility rule. Okay? Yes, sir? Infinite. 119,000 change in assets. And the house? The, the, it, the question is, what is the spouse allowed to have if the other spouse needs nursing home care? And the, the, your answer is correct. You're allowed to have the house as long as it has an equity of less than $828,000. By the way, that's a big deal in Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket because everybody's house is more than that, you know, at least in Nantucket. So what you do, what I tell people in that case is always get a reverse mortgage. Always get a reverse mortgage. Don't pull any money out. Right? But get a reverse mortgage so that if you get stuck going to the nursing home, in these spousal cases, we can pull enough money out that we can get the equity down below $828,000. So, yes, the, the house is correct. $119,220 in cash and infinite income. And the way that you convert the asset into income is by buying the annuity. Right? right? As long as it meets those criteria. The only issue that comes up on the annuities is that, is that <clears throat> commercially, it is very hard to get an annuity yeah, I would say it's pretty much impossible to get an annuity for a term of shorter than five years, a commercial annuity for a term of shorter than five years, because the interest rates are so low that they won't write them. Uh, if Frank's, at Frank's life expectancy at 89 uh, is, is just over five years, if he's over 89, he's, we're going to have trouble buying him an annuity, right? We've done, we've done that with, we've, we've remedied that in a couple of cases by actually using private annuities. Have, have you, the son, uh, be the person who is doing the annuity and return for, we'll give you all the cash and you do the annuity. But we're always nervous about those. So, uh, yes, sir. Uh, are any of these uh, laws affected uh, by, in, in our case, we're registered aliens rather than citizens? Are you, are you, um, you so you're resident, you're, re, you're, re, but you're, but you're, you're non-citizen aliens, but you've got your, you've got your magic card. For, so, you know, in, in the shorthand, you got the green card. For mass health purposes, you're in. No, you're, the same rules apply to you that apply to everybody else, right? Um, the, for, for estate tax purposes, you've got a problem. You know, if you've got, if, if you've got possible estate tax issues, then you want to talk to somebody about that because stuff gets taxed differently if, there's a, a res, if it's the death of a resident of an alien as opposed to a, resident, a uh, citizen, okay? Other questions? Yes, ma'am? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to back to what she said. What is the remedy for her to put it the house in a trust? I, the, the question is, what's the remedy? And I think that's the right answer. I think, I, think that, I, think she, I think she names one of the daughters as the trustee of the trust for the benefit of the both daughters. She keeps a life estate in the property so that she feels secure, right? Um, with the clocks running, hopefully she makes it past the five years, but that way if, if she hasn't made it past the five years, the house is still available and can be retransferred back to her and it's not gonna, it's not gonna have a bad effect on her, right? It's a lot safer, while at the same time you're still preserving, the, in terms of the ultimately going to the daughters, as long as it can, you're still preserving that for the daughters and you're getting that clock running. I think that's the better solution. <clears throat> in my case, mine are stepsons. They can be anybody. Doesn't make any difference. They could be me. You could give it to me. <laughs> Keep a life estate. I'll do the legal documents for free. Okay. For f <laughs> and, and, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I should, I should stop. Thank you very much because it's been more than I'm glad to, start, to stay here for a few minutes to answer questions. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll see you in the fall. Thank you.